Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. This episode features Randy Barron, a uh, portfolio manager at Pinnacle Associates. Randy was recommended by friends of the pod, Andrew Walker and Chad Garcia. I enjoyed talking to him. This is a bit of a different one. We are going to go deep in a discussion on a company called Amaris. It is what I would deem a risky asset if you don't understand what's going on. Randy may disagree. That's fine. As someone talking to a listener that may need to hear it, do not listen to a podcast and go out and purchase a stock based on what somebody says on a podcast. This is all for entertainment. You know this. I disclose it all the time. But I think that uh, Amaris specifically probably requires a little bit extra. But it is a fascinating company. And it got me researching synthetic biology and some of what's going on in biotech. And I'm super happy that we had this conversation because, frankly, it got me excited to research things again. So I appreciate Randy coming on the show. I enjoy talking to Randy. We've done a couple calls offline. He's a great guy. And I hope you all enjoy the show. This episode is sponsored by Stratosphere.io. That's S-T-R-A-T-O-S-P-H-E-R-E dot I-O. Stratosphere.io is a web-based terminal that has financial data, KPIs, links to filings, hedge fund letters, and much more. I like the interface. I think my man Braden is a good dude. He is constantly iterating. He's released a couple new releases, which I like a lot. The UI is improving. Not that it had far to go, but I appreciate what he's doing. And he takes data quality super seriously. Everything is triple checked for accuracy. I have enjoyed doing comparative analysis on different companies within the product. Stratosphere saves users like myself time and enables easy comparisons between companies and offers company-specific metrics such as subscriber counts, number of locations, etc. If you are using the product and happen to stumble upon a company that doesn't have KPIs, ping my man Braden and his team. They are quick. They are responsive. They will fix the issue. Head on over to stratosphere.io for a free trial. That's S-T-R-A-T-O-S-P-H-E-R-E dot I-O for a free trial. And should you want to sign up for a paid offering, please use the promo code BREW, B-R-E-W, for 15% off. You know the drill, as always. None of this is financial advice. All of the information contained in this program is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your financial advisor before making investment decisions and do your own due diligence. Further, past performance is not indicative of future results. Investing involves risks, including the loss of capital. And that's all I got. Enjoy the show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to be joined by Randy Barron today, a, uh, a multiple guests, friends of the show, uh, Andrew Walker and Chad Garcia, both recommended that we talk. And uh, that's how we do things here. And Randy and I talked a little while ago, and I had a good time talking to him. So I hope you all enjoy the conversation. Randy, how are you doing today? I'm good, Bill. Um, thanks for the privilege of being here. I think to your point, we first spoke, I think it was 2021. So it's you know a long time coming, but change done come. We're here. Yeah, it has been a while. I didn't realize it had been that long. The days are long. The years are fast, you know? <laughs> And the poetry never stops on this show. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. It depends if I'm writing it or not, but I appreciate the compliment. Yeah. Um, so what's going on? You want to tell people where you're from and uh, how you think about the world? Yeah. I mean, let me give some background because I think, especially in today's day and age, as we're recording this in early 2022, it helps. 2023. Frame, 2023. We're still doing right. that on text, aren't we? Um, <laughs> It helps frame kind of where where we're at, right? So I have been in the business 25 years, give or take. Um, started in the 90s um, at Lazar doing what was essentially data entry um, on Lotus 1, 2, 3, even predating Excel. And the guy I worked for there uh, is pretty seminal, became a mentor to me and someone that I kind of stayed with for the first at least chapter of my career. It's a guy named Sal Moyo. Uh, Sal Moyo is important because in the arc of Mario Gabelli and Gamco uh, back in the 80s and 90s when Mario was a couple hundred million versus the 30 some odd billion behemoth he is today, uh, it was really 
you know, in that inaugural class, it was Sal, his son, Mark, a bunch of other people. So after hmm. he had left, Interesting. he had left Mario and the people forget the first kind of cell phone call was uh, in the mid eighties. It was the old brick. And he had come with a telecom background from Mario to become head of research at Lazard. And he was, I think in, in two years, he published four reports. Lazar referred to it as like the, the one of like the most asymmetric investments they'd made. BET had come public around that time. And uh, all that to say, by the late 90s, Sal was off doing his own fun. And that's kind of where I spent the first decade of my career, uh, really doing a deep dive into, uh, let's call it value with the catalyst. So I'm going to pause there for your listeners that may not be as familiar with kind of where Mario Gabelli fits into the pantheon of great investors. But if Ben Graham was kind of the original cigar butt, although of course he didn't call it that, Buffett did, investor for value, just looking for things that were trading below liquidation value. Buffett with Munger kind of evolved that to look for quality businesses, you know, franchises that you could just basically grow. Like if you were going to manage a lot of assets, you couldn't do kind of these piecemeal penny stocks, right? And then Mario, and I think he trademarked this, although I'm not sure, he kind of took it to the next level and basically came up with a, a framework out of that, let's call it the Columbia Business School Mafia approach and said, you know, we're going to look for things that have private market value, which is another way of saying intrinsic value, like what a strategic would pay with a catalyst. And that was kind of the important thing. And that, of course, people that know uh, Mr. Gabelli from CNBC don't maybe realize he's one of the great stock pickers of his generation. Those people that know him as a stock picker don't realize he's one of the great marketers. So in our business is very rare to have someone that's Yeah, both. he's got a both. He's got both. And it's super rare. Yeah. And so I was really fortunate to make my bones uh, with Sal as my mentor in the first decade, kind of out of that Gabelli spotlight. So we got all the stock picking prowess with none of the focus and drama that comes with kind of being the tip of the spear when it comes to the marketing side. And so that really meant that we were allowed to what, what they called truffle hunt. You would go and hmm. spend days searching ideas. And Bill, as you and I both know, often those journeys are long and arduous and, and don't result in anything, right? You may get to the end of your journey and say, hey, listen, this really isn't anything interesting. And you know, the, the reason I give all that in-depth background, and we can certainly go into the Gabelli side more, um, is that I really regard myself as a value investor, which is pretty funny because the thing that I'm known for is we look at the last decade of my career. Yeah, your portfolio is kind of growthy, huh? Well, yeah. And so yeah. this is an interesting uh, dichotomy. And I'm with a firm called Pinnacle Associates. We are long-only managers. We manage about six and a half or $7 billion US. And I run our international strategies. The, the one that you're referring to mostly there is our international small cap. And there's a whole lot of reasons uh, why I enjoy this and kind of took it over, but not the least of which is valuations elsewhere outside of America are a lot more compelling, right? So this gets kind of gets to the value bent. Um, but I also had this realization maybe five or seven years ago that the dichotomy, and, and Howard Marks has talked about this a lot, that the dichotomy between value and growth, which often consultants will make you check a box, right? Are you deep value? Are you value? Are you GARP? Are you growth? Often, that's a false dichotomy, right? It's something that you're checking the box to get in the door, especially on what I do, the institutional side, to say, hey, listen, you know, look at us, at least consider us. But we're making some sacrifices to the process. And I, I guess the reason I give that long-winded intro is despite being known as a growth manager, despite being known as a UK investor, we can talk about all these things, where I'm coming from is a value bent. And I think that's really important. Yeah, I agree. I, I think um, one of the things that I enjoyed in our, in our first conversation was uh, when, you were, when you were talking about kind of why you thought um, there was more opportunity for like today's uh, managers to start looking outside the US and uh, specifically, you know, smaller, which I know, you know, you're, you're a little bit talking your own book, but I think you're talking your own book because you actually believe in it. So I was, uh, I was hoping that you might riff on that a little bit, uh, just to contextualize what you see. Yeah. And, and I, I should stress, certainly any portfolio manager that comes on is going to talk their own book to some degree. But I talked about this in my, my year and letter, the names that we hold today, 
are the names that we held in the pandemic are the names that we held before the pandemic, right? So, so again, going back to kind of that value tint, in, in essence, I kind of view what we're doing because I get to get so deep with the companies that I'm in as private equity and public forum, right? Like the relationships that I'm forming with these managements, uh, just as an anecdote, you know, in COVID, when the world was falling apart, it was pretty easy to pick up a phone and call someone that you have a five-year relationship with and say, hey, Bill, is it really that bad in Florida, as they say? Like, let's just yeah. give me some, some anecdotes on the ground and you can get that kind of feedback. And I think, you know, you've had other guests on the show, Jeremy Raper, most notably, who talks about interacting with management is not part of their process at all, right? You'll talk to people that say, I've never heard management, any management anywhere, give a bad spin on the story, right? But part of our job as allocators of capital is to basically try and see through that, right? To make a decision at any given moment, is this something you want to own today? And I think people tend to forget that every day you wake up, it's a new day, right? And the portfolio you hold, while right or wrong for yesterday, you need to decide, is it the right one for today? Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the international side, so I should probably uh, dive in there. So uh, I'm known, especially in the UK, and I'll, I'll go into why we did so much work in, in England and Britain and kind of the Commonwealth. Uh, we're known as growth, and we find great growth opportunities all over the globe. About 40% of the book is the UK. Now, I mentioned before, that was about five to seven years ago, we started making that pivot. That was a pretty poor time to start investing in the UK, right? Brexit. I mean, England, the UK has been a pariah ever since Brexit. And if you look at kind of PEs again, like you said, 2023, we're recording this. At the end of last year, you know, the US market is roughly 17 times forward on a PE multiple. The UK is 10 times call. And right, and, and a lot of the businesses are comparable. So if I can buy something cheaper with a, a similar cultural norm, and we can kind of get into the difference in gap and IRS, but that doesn't really matter. The, the reason I ended up becoming so known for the UK was when I took over this international strategy uh, seven years ago, I discovered, and this is like the dirty little secret of international small cap, by the way. And, and for your listeners, I define small cap as anything under $5 billion of market value at purchase. So we're not talking about the Costco's and Walmart's of the world, right? We're talking about yeah. those really small things that could grow and to become that, but let's see how it goes. Anyway, I discovered a third of the benchmark is Japan. And I hmm. hit my head against the wall for three years trying to solve Japan, right? I'm not a Japan, I'm not a Japan specialist by background. Um, I don't have any great insight into the culture. Uh, we hired Japanese analysts, we hired Chinese analysts who, who read Japanese. We did everything we thought we could to get access and to get differentiated value. And that's the other thing I should pause there and say, the reason I'm not going to talk about a Walmart or a Costco or a Comcast or Dish, which I saw you were working on lately, is I feel like I'm never going to be able to compete head to head with the Goldman analyst who's got 12 people kicking doors, right? And, and this goes back to the Gabelli thing. The things that I want to know, I want to know them better than anyone. And that sounds a little bit like hubris, but the truth is when you just live you know, a stock, people are like, okay, how do you know more than a sell side analyst? Well, a sell side analyst may have 15 names that they cover, right? If I've got two or three or four names that I'm most known for, I'm by definition going to know, I live and die by those names, right? I'm going to know them better. And so in that journey with Japan, uh, when I realized basically it was a black hole and I had this kind of lurking suspicion, especially for the US, US based asset managers that do international small cap, that that third of their book, Japan, is essentially a plug, right? They're just basically mm -hmm. matching ETF. I made a decision that that wasn't kind of for an active manager, something that was of great appeal to me. And I started saying, all right, well, where else can I go around the world um, to find names where I could make a difference? And it turned out the UK, and by the way, I'm speaking about the greater Commonwealth, what, what Churchill referred to as the Commonwealth, South Africa, Australia, Canada, you know, these places where we can get on the phone and despite, you know, I speak Spanish, but like, I don't need to even go down that path. Let's just have a conversation and hold accountable the decisions you make. I mean, this is one of the things when you meet a new company, it's always interesting, right? Because you get the, the best possible spin on a business. Um, but the only way you know 
how managements are going to do is you're in the trenches with them over time. And so the way that we allocate is we put a little bit of money in if we like the idea, and then see if they deliver over time, it will come back and back. And then by the way, I'd rather keep paying up as it goes. Like that's kind of- mm, the, the That's interesting. So that's, that's why the UK, uh, if you're a company that's doing a TTW testing the water, I'm probably one of, in, in the UK markets, I'm probably one of your first five or 10 phone calls. Um, there are some real structural issues against the UK last year. There was a billion dollars of IPO total. It's down from 14 billion huh. to 21. But there's also a lot of US businesses that are choosing to list overseas. And people are like, well, why would that be? If you're a CEO of a company that's trying to go public, you just want access to the capital markets. You don't really care where it is. Maybe you don't want, you know, Canada. You may, you may have like certain biases that you're working through, but at the end of the day, you want money in the bank. And the appeal for smaller companies to the UK versus the US is you do not have the same reporting requirements. So if I take away two 10Q reporting requirements because it's a six month process, all of a sudden, if you're a small, call it 10 million revenue company, and I've taken out $700,000 of filing, lawyer, and accounting costs, that ain't nothing, right? That rolls all the way through to cash flow. And that's why you're, you're seeing a lot of US businesses, at least in the middle, early stages, looking to say, okay. And by the way, maybe two or three years later, you'll cross list and come to NASDAQ yeah. or come. But in terms of just accessing capital markets versus going a venture route and having a 25 year old in your boardroom for three days telling you you're the worst person on earth, right? These really kind of toxic board meetings, uh, especially for founders that have put a lot of their blood and sweat into companies, they want to be kind of left alone and left to run. They don't really want to be micromanaged as they would on a venture, kind of a private equity levered upside. Do you find that they give up? Like, do you have some sort of easier corporate governance if you're going public in the UK at that size? Or I assume Canada is another possible place that people are going public. Canada is different mostly because of the commodities, right? Like if you're living yeah. in Canada, you're probably a miner of one kind or another, right? Like, I, and that's a broad stroke, but you get my, my point. The UK is a little different in that there's, there's positives and negatives. The positives we talked about, you have less reporting fees. Uh, MIFTA changed the rules in Europe versus the US, where the sell side, as we think of it in the US, does not exist the same way. You need to pay to play. If you want to get research hmm. in, in Europe, now the continent, you're paying for that. By the way, Interesting. that's what's going to happen in America, right? Which is also, we could talk a little bit about the moment of why the democratization of research has become so much more important, right? Seeking Alpha has never been more important than it is today as sell-side firms are clamping down and down and there's just less commissions to pay, right? Like you can see where that, where that business goes. Uh, the negatives of listing in the UK are the culture is super conservative right? Which may not matter if you're like a traditional banking stock, right? Probably doesn't matter, right? You, you kind of look at what your interest paid versus what received is, and you can kind of do the math. The average analyst in England versus the US is a generalist versus in the US, you're more sector specific, right? And so because of that, if you have a company, there's a company I'm known for, uh, actually, uh, Chad Garcia, you mentioned, he and I talk about this company. He's, in, he doesn't, he's not in it, but it's called Wandisco. It's the top performing stock in England last year. Um, and by the way, in the years before that was like the most low stock of all time. But a tech, Funny how that works. Yeah, it's totally how it works. But it's a tech stock that was never fully understood in the UK. And people are like, well, how is that possible? Well, think about the US. In 21, like a peak kind of tech IT gig sector allocation was roughly 40% of the S&P, right? The FANGs, all this stuff. The FTSE, the UK equivalent, 3% tech. Hmm. So by definition, if you're a generalist, you're never going to get in the weeds to that level as you would have to if a benchmark's 40% in tech. And so that company, Wandisco, for example, has kind of been in the wilderness of the UK for, God, over half a decade. But this year, 2023, they're going to come list to NASDAQ. They're going to get re-rated. And this is a whole virtuous cycle. So... UK is really interesting for what I do, that early stage company that's looking to grow into a big platform. And especially for someone like me who's relationship driven, I get to know the management. We get to spend a lot of time, we get to see a lot of mistakes made, right? But then as they kind of keep growing, we keep funding them. And then you come out to this, I don't want to say the promised land, but at least a place where you're more recognized by intuitive people that will do the work. And I'll give you just on, on that Wandisco example, you know, this is basically the company that owns the algorithm to the cloud. So if you want to have uh, the best example is like if you go to an airport 
and, and you got to buy a flight last minute, right? How do you know that the, what the ticket person's telling you is the same at the back office in India? I'm not talking nine nines five or five nines reliability. I'm talking live data, like the same. These guys own the algorithm. So anytime data goes to and from the cloud, becomes more important with autonomous vehicles, becomes more important with Internet of Things, they run a meter. Okay. But in that business, backlog matters a lot. Okay. So it's revenue plus pay, call it backlog. They're trading at four times. Snowflake's trading at 12 times, right? And I'm not saying when you re-rate to the US, you're going to get 10 times and this is where you should trade. But, you know, somewhere in the middle, to quote that old country song, you started your French post, I'll start a mine. We'll meet in the middle. It kind of makes sense. Why are they, is it, is it like a $9 million revenue company or 10 million? Am I not seeing when, that right? When Disco? Yeah. So yeah, when Disco uh, is going to do basically 100 million of revenue plus RPO in 2022. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm not seeing it right. But again, this is kind of to your to your point. Now this thing by the way does trade on the US as well, but it's like a synthetic, so it doesn't really matter. What matters is the London underlying security. But to the point, yes, when you see like Stiefel covers them for example, Good Body covers them. All the analysts are kind of offsides cuz this guy, the CEO was so low, right? This goes back to relationships. He would, because he had pivoted the business, it wasn't making money. And people were totally convinced that he was driving us into the ground. Well, he made the right call. Half of his contracts today are cash up front, right? So that mm -hmm. US listing I mentioned that's coming this summer is not because they need money. I mean, obviously, they'll take money as part of the process, but they're funding the business, self-funding. And so no one kind of believes this backlog. Is it going to convert to revenue? I mean, they were up 9x year on year, their backlog. They announced one deal in December that was bigger than their entire 2021 revenue base, to your point about trailing revenue. So, you know, part of the, the business, when you talk about what defines successful investing today, you know, I, I would argue there's so much data out there, right? You talk about stratosphere.io on your podcast a lot, that people can access anything. It really becomes kind of not the quantitative edge, but qualitative, kind of almost non-computable factors as well as some sense of how things are going to unfold in the future. And that's the art of what we do. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, I pulled up Wandisco. That, that is a pretty nice stock chart for the last year. That's, uh, what, uh, 4X or so, 3X? And mostly, if you look at it, mostly from the third or fourth quarter. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, this, this go, and I've been in the stock, okay, so, so to be totally fair, so we're not like just cherry picking. I've been in the stock four or five years. Right. Yeah. So we've been through we've been through the darkness. But going back to what I said about the UK being a pariah for investors since Brexit, I mean the, the US market is essentially doubled in that time frame. The UK is essentially flat. Um, you know, there's a great adage, and this is stealing from Jim Grant, but you know, even mushrooms sometimes grow in the dark. Right. So if you yeah. can kind of find a geography that's totally forsaken and then find a sector that's not understood in that geography. And then take the time to find an individual security in that sector. You know, you have a lot of headwind, but when the tailwind finally turns to your point, it ends up being a pretty nice return. Yeah. I, uh, I hate to do this to you this early in the conversation, but the one that is screaming into my head, given how, uh, how often I've heard you talk about it, okay. is uh, Amorous, right? So how do you, when, when you're this um, plugged into management, and when you own things and you're identifying as sort of a long-term or not sort of, but when you're identifying as a long-term investor and you know management and you're committed to the idea, um, you know, Amaris has not exactly had a great 12 month stretch, at least from a stock perspective. And I think with the raises, uh, some might argue from a fundamental perspective, how do you kind of, uh, make sure that you're not, um, I don't know, how, how are you not believing your own hype? How do you stay rational on an idea? All right, I'm gonna, I, I have to be careful on the Amherst because as you say, this is the thing that I am most associated with. Um, I was in Yeah, I, I don't mean to do this to you. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm happy <laughs> But to I also, that. it's, it's I, interesting. I'm gonna, for your audience, I'm gonna take a minute um, and just explain what Amherst is, okay? Just so they understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, it would help me. I, I, I've read the registration statement. I've read the 10K. I could hear it again and it would be helpful. So well, thank you. And, and I was laughing. I gave a, a speech at the, the London stock market last May, so May of 22. And there was, there was, he stopped publishing on the name to your point about how disastrous the stock price has been. 
But uh, the best analyst on the name was the HSBC guy, Harsha Papa, who's our chemicals analyst. And he actually came to the name because he covers like DSM and, I, and some of the big names. And he said, what's the future? And they all said synthetic biology, which we're going to get into with your audience in a second. And he looked at me over, over tea, which is what they do in the UK. And he said, hey, how do you feel about the fact that you're like the Henry Blodgett of Amaris, right? Like Henry Blodgett, for those <laughs> who are younger in the audience, this was a guy in the 90s and 2000s that was known as the Amazon guy, right? And yeah. that was, and I kind of, I, I had never thought about it in those terms before. And I turned and I said to him, I was like, you know what? <laughs> if I end up, you know, in the cardboard box in the park, because, you know, I've totally staked my claim to this. Um, at least I want my kids to be proud of the fact that it was for a company trying to save the world. And I don't say that with hyperbole. We'll get into that in a minute. You had a guest on your show a couple of maybe months ago, Mark Cahodes, who talked about um, Enovix. Yeah. And he talked about how he came with great passion and a lot of cursing. As he does. As he does. <laughs> and he talked about how did he come to the name. And I don't even remember this, but it's the same kind of start of Amherst, how a lot of people came to it. Um, that, that stock, is, so a lot of the, the guy who invested, the chairman there, had been the uh, chairman of a company called Enphase as well. Enphase was a solar stock that was distressed. Uh, Jim Rogers and John Doerr came and put in together $10 million. And that stock then ran from two to 300. I mean, that's, that's simplifying it, but it was one of the great success stories of solar. John Doerr, uh, for those in your audience who don't know, is one of the principals of Kleiner Perkins and was the first investor in Amazon, was the first investor in Google. So arguably the most, in terms of dollar return, uh, successful venture capitalist in history. The reason I start with that is John Doerr owns 33, 34% of Amherst today. And so a lot of people kind of came to the story from the end phase success and say, okay, what's John Doerr's next public play that's not as known? Right Can now? I just, I just want to add one small addendum to that. He's also owns the debt. Right. So just when people hear that. In Amherst? Uh, he, yeah, doesn't he? He's got yeah, but he, he, he yeah. 33% of the equity. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. He's senior. He's senior in the stack. And to be totally transparent, I own the debt as well as the equity as well okay. of Amherst. But I'm giving you like, he owns a third of the business. For, for yeah, yeah. I just want, I just don't want somebody to hear it and not understand the, everything that's going on. Right. And so what is Amherst? Amherst is the leading player in a nascent sector called synthetic biology. And of course, that's a fancy term where people say, okay, what is that? So synthetic biology is essentially a really high highfalutin term for advanced biology. It's basically saying we have so much computing power now, we have AI, we have all this ability to not skip evolution, but essentially to iterate quicker, okay? So they specifically have sugar tanks uh, down in Brazil, basically next to Ryzen, which is the largest sugar cane producer in the world. They have a 24 football field long precision fermenter. I mean, think about that 24 football fields in length. Wow, that's and, nuts. And it's literally abutting the Ryzen property, Ryzen, the largest producer of sugar cane. And they take the sugar cane, which is their propent. They put it in the, think of it like uh, brewing beer, right? Big, much, much bigger vats. But the idea of you put in some sugar, you put in a biological agent to grow yeast in this case, and you make out some other molecules at the tail end. Uh, they are not the only uh, name in the space. The, the probably more famous one is Ginkgo, which is symbol DNA, the old Genentech symbol. Um, and the Ginkgo CEO, Jason Kelly, who is a great promoter, uh, kind of describes it this way, which is what's harder to make? Is it the actual Apple phone that you and I own, or is it the apple that you plant in the ground that grows a tree, that grows a branch, that grows an apple. Like what the, the point being, biology is really good at complex things. And the longer term thesis, which is kind of even beyond our investable conversation, is that we're going to be at a point where biologically we're going to be able to manufacture a lot of things. And why does that matter? It matters because our chemistry process today is destroying the world. And for those of us like you and me that have kids that care about our kids having a future, clean chemistry is going to play a really important part of that. Um, people don't realize, for example, when you take a vitamin in the morning, what is it? It's mostly petroleum that you're putting into your body. 
you know, I think about like when you and I grew up, talcum powder was a thing. You would not use talc, right? Because it's a carcinogen on your kids today. And so the idea of clean, especially to those people in their 20s and 30s, especially to those people in their 30s with kids, they care a lot more about what they're putting on their kids than maybe our parents did about us, okay? That's the thesis. Amorous, um, while still a startup in practical terms, is actually two decades long in the public arena. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came to them. It was a, a UC, I think it was um, Berkeley, one of, one of the California schools, came to them and said, hey, listen, we want to solve the problem of malaria. Can you help us make artemisinin, which is the drug that's used for malaria? And by the way, Amherst did. Uh, when Sanofi, who was the person that scaled it up, took their uh, formula from the lab, there was a lot of issues on the scaling up, which is what gives Amherst its moat, by the way. They have about a six or seven year moat in terms of scale. Um, they then, in the 2010 era, said, all right, we're going to try and solve a bigger issue for the planet than malaria, which is fossil fuels. And so when oil was $100 a barrel, Amherst went out and synthesized petroleum. Now, they didn't see the shell revolution coming. And what's really interesting from that era, and you talk about the debt on this company, is that Amherst is the last man standing of all the public and bio companies that existed 10 plus years ago because they were scrappy and they issued debt and they issued shares. And it was a terrible kind of moment to get through, but they had made fuel. They realized they couldn't sell it profitably because shale revolution had come, oil had dropped to $30 a barrel, but they realized they had something. And what they had was a seven carbon chain, seven atom carbon chain that they had on fuel. And out of that, they created something called Farnazine. We don't need to get into that. What matters is the application of Farnazine. And here kind of begins the new Amra story is through Farnazine, they created something called squalane. And squalane has been known especially in Japan, for 200 years. It's the best emollient. It's a new term. It means conditioner, basically, um, in the world. And if you go to, like, much like I mentioned Japanese investing, like the dirty little secret of international small cap, the dirty little secret of the beauty industry, if you go to Sephora, is squalane. So if you walk the, the aisles of Sephora, you look at L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, Shishido, you do your own channel check, you will see all the high-end products have squalane. Doesn't yeah. this come from like whales or something? Sharks. That's exactly right. Yeah. So the way you harvested it historically was either from olives, which is not really uh, shelf stable, or from the livers of sharks. To your point, and what I said earlier about saving the world, Amherst today represents 60% of the squalane market in the world. In so doing, they are saving the lives of 3 million sharks per year. Now, that's not the investment thesis. But it's a pretty cool corollary to the thesis, how they applied it. And they basically have a, you know, a hub and spoke system. I mentioned this plant in Brazil. That's where they do the ingredient side. But ingredients is much lower margin. So in order to get closer to the consumer, they started making consumer brands. Uh, a brand that you can go, this is one of the rare companies you can actually go test what they do. So you can go to Sephora. The fastest growing brand at Sephora is a company called Biosance. It's 100% owned by Amaris. Uh, Amherst has put in roughly 50 million cumulatively over the past six years into Biosounds. It's worth a billion two today. The reason Biosounds has grown so fast is we mentioned Estee Lauder, Shishido all have squalane, okay? But it's typically four, five, six percent because to your point, shark A, shark B, shark C, they have different livers. You can't commercially scale that, right? If I'm if I'm harvesting it from the ocean. But when I make it in a clean precision lab, it's the same every time. And in fact, one of the really cool things was Estee Lauder came and said, okay, you're going to supply our squalane. We want to, we got to send our person to make sure eyes on the ground that this is like secure. We have what we need. And they looked at the amount of sugarcane that was needed to supply the entire chain, all the SKUs for Estee Lauder of squalane. And it was one and a half acres of land. And that's the point about precision. And we talk about how do you make the world a bit, like how do you make it sustainable over time? You start you stop taxing the earth's resources. And so in the case of Biosance, you know, that's just one example. I'm not going to go, they have 12 different uh, consumer brands, but another one, the, the second most important one is uh, called JVN. If anyone needs new hair product on this, uh, in this audience, I would recommend for $18, $19 a, a bottle, you go try it. Uh, this is the top performing non-silicon conditioner and shampoo in the, in the, in the mm -hmm. world. 
And people say, well, okay, think about conditioner. When you condition your hair, what makes it soft? Typically, it's silicones. There is such a thing as a non-silicone uh, hair conditioner, but that is the same chemical composition as what goes on your car in the car wash. Hmm. Facts. And so what they did, they had squalene, which exists in nature, right? We're talking about sharks. They came up with something called hemisqualene that does not exist in nature. It doesn't exist. And they said, all right, let's make the, the softness of silicon. And the reason you don't want silicon is that it does not biodegrade in the water. So you take your shower, you flush out your conditioner, goes in the pipes, and then you don't think about it again. But we're literally going to the ocean with all these silicons. Huh. And so yet again, Estee Lauder, Shishido, they all go to Sephora, which is LVMH owned. Hmm. And they say, what is this hemisqualene? Where is this coming from? And all of a sudden, Sephora says, hey, you got to go to Amherst to buy it, right? They're the world's producer of hemisqualene. The same thing, there's another molecule, ectoene, which is a great moisturizer. They just launched a brand with Naomi Watts that's for menopause. It's the first truly commercial menopause brand. Um, anyway, you get where I'm going with this. So the, yeah. the, the consumer side is the tip of the spear that introduces the molecule that then spins the flywheel and gets the backside of the business, which is lower margin, but much bigger volume to supply. And that's how the business model works. Hmm. I can get down with saving some oceans. I mean, it's one of these things. I don't think, and we could do a tangent here on socially responsible investing. Um, you know, it's it, when you look at Barron's, right, and who they rank as the top 10 SRI companies. I don't know if you've ever looked at it. It's, it's scandalous, actually. I did it once. I, I just tried. assume everybody buys their way onto those. Well, okay. That's a super important point. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But the SRI conversation, like Best Buy is top 10. Like, I'm sure Best Buy is a great company, but are <laughs> you really so, like, and by the way, Tiffany is top 10 because yeah. they don't use blood diamonds. Like, it's one of these vicious cycles. And, and there was a company I used to own, I don't anymore, uh, called Azure, A Z R E. It's a Indian, New York Stock Exchange listed, but Indian uh, solar company that when you would look at like the SRI or socially responsible investing metrics scored a 25 out of 100. And for the life of me, I could not figure out why that was. Uh, maybe because there's lithium. And I, I, I honestly was like trying to get into, I, I was like so deep on this. So I called them up. I said, guys, how, how are you an Indian solar company? 25 out of 100. And the answer was so mind uh, numbingly obvious that I can't. They said, Randy, we're a mid to small cap company. We are not going to hire a lawyer to be on the payroll to just file the paperwork to say what we already know we are. Yeah. Right. And so yeah, this like, makes sense to me. It, it's one of these weird things where SP and Moody's, the correlation you know, on bond ratings is essentially 1.0. There's 300 different SRI rating agencies, and the correlation is 0 0.1. There's no, because you may care about environment. I may care about social. You know, our friend may care about water, right? And oceans or board or diversity. It's, and actually, John Doerr, going back to Amherst, his solution to this, I actually think is really interesting. He's like, at the end of the day, petroleum is the major issue, carbon, that we need to resolve. His theory is he wants every company in the world to have a carbon score, positive or negative. And that would therefore influence the credits and all stuff. Like it actually is an interesting simplification, but it's an interesting idea. And, you know, it's something that, again, it's not my North Star, but I want to invest in things that are trying to do good for the world. I don't think that's, you know, a terrible thing to say. So out of all the stocks in the world to choose, uh, there, there seems to be a lot of, um, like execution risk for lack of a better term is what I'm thinking, but maybe I'm not framing it correctly. Is is the reason that you have Amaris in the portfolio that you see such a potential uh, return that it's worth some of this risk of dilution and whatever may yeah. come between now and then? You summarize it exactly right, which is this is the kind of name that in my 25 years in the business, I have never seen such potential. Now, whether that becomes realized potential or unrealized, that's TBD. But the way I describe it is it is akin to investing in the internet in 1993, right? Like I was not investing back then to make the decision between pets.com and Amazon and what was going to be the one that would survive. But I do know that if synthetic biology is going to have a future, owning the foundational play with all the foundational IP um, is going to matter. To your, to your point about how poorly the stock has performed, they've had to do a lot of things to survive, 
right? They raised, uh, in the last 12 months, they've raised $850 million. In the last 12 months, they have spent $850 million. And in a world, especially in the 2022, 2023 market, where there is no sympathy given for cash burn, you know, the stock was shellacked. Totally true. But I was also, and this is going back to what we said at the outset, by being in these companies for so long, I've been through the cycle before. And in 20, if you go back to your, um, to your stratosphere.io kind of screen and you pull a five-year chart and you look back to 2020 when the stock ran from similar prices as today to 2022 to, or 20, 2022 dollars a share and then fell off again, you know, the chances of bankruptcy back then were roughly, in my estimate, about 20%, 20 percent, two zero. I mean, there's literally, I've never seen a 10Q filing before where the CFO at the time had lent a million dollars to the company so they could keep the lights hmm. on, which by the way, speaks to, you know, terrible cash management, but also speaks to the dedication of the people working there that they're like, we can change the world, right? Um, today, I calculate the chance of bankruptcy as roughly two to 3%, right? Hmm. I mean, the business itself has exponentially more revenues than it did at that time. The balance sheet, ironically, has a lower uh, interest rate, but has similar levels of cash. There's a big strategic transaction coming, uh, which will change that in the next couple months. Um, the actual brands, you know, they have a new ethos, which is if these new brands, we talked about kind of the 12 ones that exist, if they don't generate at least $20 million in annual recurring revenue, they're gone. And so this kind of focus is what's going to see them through. They also have a whole, like there, I mentioned that huge 24 football field length. It's called Barra Bonita, the, the plant in Brazil. It's totally unencumbered. You could borrow on that, right? You have mentioned John Doerr. He's made loans to the company before. You have access there. So you have a lot of liquidity paths on the way through. But the main reason the stock is down, and we would be doing a disservice if we didn't talk about this, is I mentioned David Richards, who's the CEO of Wandisco, is a loathed figure, at least he's out of the wilderness, right? That stock price is up and people tend to have revised views uh, when the stock is doing well. In the case of Amaris, the CEO is a guy named John Mello, who has been there for 14 years. I have never seen, especially someone who's very public about their Amaris holdings, right? And, I, and in this age of internet trolls, I would not recommend that. It's like a healthy lifestyle choice. <laughs> um, I have never seen such personal attacks about him. Yeah. Like well, dude, I could hear it. Uh, well, uh, what was it? The JP Morgan analyst when she was asking, why aren't you going to hit 2 billion and 30% operating margins instead of 1 billion? And, you know, I mean, I, I, I was like, oh, this is, this is the kind of question that drives the street nuts on a gross well, stock. And by the way, his answer to that question was even more aggravating, which was, he's like, cause they had guided down from two to 1 billion to your point. And then she asked the question, Rachel asked the question, and he says, well, it's probably actually going to be a billion six or billion seven. Like it totally sounded like he was just pulling this from, you know, from yeah. there. But he's, he's basically saying, here's what the internal model is. We're discounting to that because you never know supply chain, all this craziness that has happened in the last couple of years. Like, are we going to be more global as a culture or less global? It's still to be determined. It's a really, really hard thing to be a promotional salesperson as a CEO, which every CEO should be, by the way, to promote their stock, to keep a company going, while at the same time trying to live in a culture of under-promise and over-deliver, right? Which is like what the street wants. Why do you say that about uh, CEOs promoting their stock? I, I happen to, th I think I agree, but I think a lot of people might be offended by that statement. Well, I'm sure a lot of what I would say would offend people. So I'm not like, like I would your perfect guess. Defensive. No, but I, I mean, isn't the job of a CEO to be the head promoter for his company? That's all I mean yes. by that. Right? Yes, I and believe so. And so if you want to pay people, if you want to lure talent, if you want to keep talent, you can only do that if you are a put together promotional CEO. Now, now maybe it's lowercase p, maybe you're not out there, you know, on the couch, Tom Cruise won't be like, this is my company. But conceptually, if you're not cheerleading for a company, who will? Yeah. And I do think that to your point, recruiting talent, um, I, I have heard from a couple of people that I've spoken to that stocks have not done well. It, it does create an issue 
when you call people and then they pull up your stock price and they see that it's or, or vendor, gone way down. By the way, yeah. or vendors. Like if you yeah, want to have, right. let's say you want to control your cash cycle and so you're going to let your payables build, if your stock price is in the gutter, you're probably not going to be given as much latitude as if it's at all-time highs, right? Yeah. Because And even if it's not collateral, it's a perception. And so this is where I come down to with Amaris. This is what fascinates me about this moment in time. Like I really try and keep it to an intellectual level of saying, here's why I think the business today, and obviously this is not, you know, telling your audience to buy the stock in any way, but just my work says the stock is worth three to four X today in the public market from where it's trading, right? And I see a lot of different ways to get there versus the kind of emotional capitulation that is totally involved. I have never seen, like I said before, it, it's almost personal, the attacks. There, it's so much emotional of, okay, we have lost money in the stock market, therefore you're a bad person. And what yeah. people don't realize is the stock price of any security only matters at one moment in time, which is the moment you're selling it. Right now it may matter for people like me that could grade it, right? Like I get graded quarterly and you know what? It was a terrible quarter last year because of it. But conceptually, the only time you should care about the stock price, if you know what you own is when you're selling it. And the only real advice I'd give your, your audience or anyone is don't look at a stock price every day. Unless you're actively trading options, there is no need to spend eight hours a day and feeling good or bad about yourself based on how a stock is trading. Right. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I, I when I was doing well, I was looking a lot and I felt greed in myself and I thought this probably isn't healthy. And then when I took a punch last year, uh, I was looking a lot and I was like, well, this isn't healthy. And then I said, well, if it's not healthy when it's going well and it's not healthy when it's not going well, maybe I should eliminate that activity from my life. Uh, which maybe it's just ignorance is bliss, but it has been a nicer existence. No, everyone does it. it were, there was something nice about the era of newspapers. Right. You sit at the morning table, you look at the sports and you look at, you know, whatever gossip and then you flip to the stock page and you see where your stocks were and you went on with your day. Yeah, right? there was something very pure about that. And the negative of kind of the always connected moment is, you know, when Amaris is up eight percent, I will literally get 10 inbound text messages. And like, yeah. I mean, maybe for me, that's great because I don't need to watch. I'll, I'll, I'll know one way or the other, but I know what I own. And by the way we should make this clear for your audience. While this is a top three holding for my strategy, you know, personally, it is a much bigger holding. So you would argue almost the inverse if it's such a big stake and, you know, I have to answer to the most important shareholder, my wife, right? That like, I need to be able to have that conversation at the dinner table. Um, you have to know what you own when you take big bets. And by the way, that's how you make real money in this world is you know something so well that you're going to just lean in and that's how compounding works. So why why is it uh, acceptable to have a bigger position in your PA than your strategy? Well, I'm invested in the strategy too. So I don't want to make it sound like it's binary. Yeah. Um, so the way that uh, we work at Pinnacle is I have a fund and then I also have separately managed accounts. And so what people tend to use me for, and again, Bill, because this is what I'm known, I find these types of companies. We talked about WAN Disco disrupting internet. We talked about... Amherst, we could talk about Renalytics disrupting kidney care. The point is, I spend all of my time looking for these type of disruptors that have exponential chances to grow. And what I found is often some of the LPs in my fund will give me additional monies to run separately, SMAs, we hmm. call it, separately managed account, that will just be the concentrated positions. And oh. so my personal account is essentially- It's kind of like an SPV, but not quite. It's almost like an SPV that I don't charge that kind of fee on. Right. Yeah. It's, and yeah. there's other clients that will use me to say, okay, you know, I, I, and we have to say this. I learned early in my kind of growth trajectory as growth investor is I have a very high tolerance for maverick risk, right? Like Buffett talks about volatility versus risk, right? Volatility, the movement in the stock day to day, the markets, it's always fickle, right? It's never at equilibrium. That does not bother me. I will take my lumps. As long as you understand why we own something, you may disagree. Reasonable people can disagree. But as long as you understand the why behind it, that's what tends to be the people that stay with me. So, you know, last year, for example, you mentioned Amaris. I had zero redemptions, which is- Oh, wow. Because for me, I was like, okay, here it comes. You know, I'm going yeah. to hear it. 
And it's because early in my career, I never understood this. People said, you don't sell performance, you sell marketing, or you sell strategy, right? You sell your approach. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like if you have good numbers, you should be able to, money begets money, right? But it's true, as I've learned over time, that if people understand the why, why are you invested in this? Why is this the thing that you are going to go to the wall for? They tend to have a lot more latitude and a lot more under, and it becomes stickier, right? Hmm. Um, so that's been, that's been good. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I figured that the answer had to do with uh, like your, your fund has portfolio construction rules yeah, attached oh no, to absolutely. it, and right? So, and so, you know, which I actually think is a good thing for most investors. I used to be like, oh, volatility doesn't, I, I've seen vol hurt enough people. Uh, and, and I've seen enough money weighted returns destroyed in, uh, in vol that I, I think some smoothing for most people makes a lot more sense well, than maybe it does in clear, theory. I personally don't use leverage. I don't use options, right? So this is straight plain vanilla equity picking. So it's not like if there's a revision to the mean, I'm going to get rolled over in some sort of call strategy, right? So yeah. I'm not, I'm controlling my risk and knowing what I own. And like I mentioned, Amaris is the first security I've owned in over a decade where I'm actually starting to buy the, the debt as well. It's trading at 33 cents in the dollar. So you, it's effectively a yield to never, right? I mean, it's a, <laughs> yeah. that's effectively what it's saying. The business isn't going to be there. And that, to me, felt like a, a nice way to diversify, move up the capital structure as well, kind of still be yeah. below John Doerr, but ahead of the equity holders in an unfortunate event, um, and also get paid a coupon. How much of what you do is uh, is like people related? Because because oh. John seems to be a really big component of the thesis, if I understand it correctly. John Mello, you're talking the CEO? No, John Doerr. John Doerr. Um, or am I incorrect? John Doerr is a big thesis for a lot of the people that are in Am in Amherst. And I speak to, I should say, I speak to everyone from some board members down to retail. Like I speak to most people in the security. Um. When you talk to John Doerr about it, you know, people are always like, well, John Mello. So there's too many Johns in the name, but John Mello is a CEO, John Doerr, a board member, along with another guy, Ryan uh, from Kleiner Perkins. Um, they said, well, how, how has John Mello, the CEO, not been replaced? I think John Doerr has lost about $2, million, $2 billion on paper. And the answer is, when you look at his history, John Doerr, you know, Google, Amazon is the most obvious ones. Uh, there were some disappointments too, but just with those two examples, he didn't make most of his returns in the first decade after being public, right? Think about Amazon, AWS did not exist in the first decade of being public, right? That's when the comp, like, and so he gives a lot of latitude. That's not what brought me to the story. What brought me to Amaris, and I don't think people know this, is there's another well-known investor named Graham Tanaka, and Graham Tanaka's son had interned at Amherst. And Graham and I invest alongside each other a lot and have known each other a long time. And Graham and I share ideas, as all of us do. And he had tried to get me to look at this Amherst story for years. And the first time I looked at it, which must have been in depth five or six years ago, I mean, the average cost of debt was 14%. I mean, it was just, it was just, it was toxic. I wasn't going to touch it. But his son went, his son was a chemical engineer. His son went to intern there and came back and reported to his dad and said, Dad, this is Google in the early days. I mean, the average age of the scientists is in the mid-20s. These guys honestly think they're changing the world. And, and that, that was like a touch point. And then when I've talked to John Doerr about this, he views it similarly as amorous or synthetic biology more generally could solve the world of this carbon problem that we're talking about because you can make it in a lab. Like they have a, a, a deal with Minerva, which is a big Brazilian meat processor, you know, where you can take a lot of carbon out of the chain there. And, and hmm. basically keeping meat fresher longer. I mean, without getting into it. Um, so John Doerr is not my thesis, but to your question, relationships are entirely my North Star. And so yeah. in my case, as much as people are really against the CEO, John Mello, he's part of the reason I'm invested there. People say, well, it can't John Doerr take this company private, right? They can he take it for a song and then he could like, you know, do a Michael Dell, relist it later and and run in the equity markets again. And I think people don't realize that people like John Doerr and John Mello care a lot about people, all their stakeholders, including shareholders, but also including employees. And if you take a company private, your options go to nil. And there'd be a thousand to 1400 people that would be totally underwater, right? And done. And, and it speaks to a broader ethos about capitalism. And do we need to be 
kind of vulture capitalists to maximize, right? Can, maybe we can, maybe there's a step below that where we can all work together um, and go. One of the, I don't know if you remember this, but one of the first things you and I talked about was what I was going to define success in my career as. And I kind of have it, I mean, maybe, maybe this is tongue in cheek or maybe even too revealing, but I have this kind of self report card that I want to judge myself not by the number of commas in my bank account per se, but really by the number of lawsuits I was party to, right? I came from a Gabelli school where that was part of doing business. Lawsuits were part of the game. To me, it felt more like, you know what, if we have that big of an issue, Bill, maybe let's you and me not do business together again. How does that sound? And trying to cut out as much agita from your life as you can felt to me kind of a more prudent way to go about it. And people come in and they say, well, Randy, you need to read Amherst. They, they take your calls. You need to read them the riot act. You need to be that guy. And I'm like, absolutely. Like, please don't think there aren't hard conversations being had, but there's a difference between being direct and being mean. And often in our business, we lose, we lose track of that, the humanity of our business, because to your point earlier, greed is involved, right? We're trying to make money. That is, that is the goal, but you can do it in a way that's palatable that you can look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. And I think that to me is at least important. Yeah. And I, I think um, the other thing is like there are fair criticisms and then there are not fair criticisms. Right. And once you get into personal attacks, you've sort of uh, debased yourself from uh, the right to have a criticism that's listened to. I think sometimes when uh, stocks go down, I don't know. The, look, these CEOs, they make a lot. They have a nice life. Uh, I, I'm not saying to feel sorry for them, but I, I would keep the attacks strictly uh, to uh, constructive criticism on, on, uh, on I mean, performance as opposed to, get, to... I'd be curious to hear your take on this. I mean, don't you feel like the era of personal attacks is higher than it's been? I mean, obviously you're a public figure, so that's a different side of it. But <laughs> well, Yeah, I, I don't have... <laughs> I just, I like to I'm I'm a little sick so I like to keep the people that uh that personally attack me I like to save it and then I like to read it <laughs> um, but but I have a lot more yeah I have a lot more people looking to help me than to to take me down right. um, but isn't that also like th this is like people talk about what's the what's the secret to life right and I don't think anyone has the answer but one of them seems to me good people should help good people and if you surround yourself with as much people trying to do the right thing. At some point, something's going to work out. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think um, I think the the highest profile, most public relationship I have is with the people over at Liberty. And you know, when when I sold Curate, uh, I I felt um, a little bit bad about it because I'd been so public about liking that business. And you know, I talked to Shane, and she was like, "That's that's the deal. Like that's your job to do, right?" Um, but I think one of the reasons that I have the relationship with them is that, you know, uh, I, 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 I believe that they're trying to do their best and I, and I say it publicly and, uh, you know, it obviously behooves them to have a relationship with somebody that's a media, but I think more than that, uh, we actually get along with each other and it's just been nice. Right. And it's like, I'm not going to bail cause the stocks are down and I'm also not going to be like, I'm not saying everything they do is roses. Right. I mean, people are free to have criticism, but I'm not going to like go at Greg because the stocks are down. That doesn't and, make and, sense. And Greg Maffei has structured some really interesting things, right, over his career. The serious, you know, 08 bias, the one of the great ones. But I, I think for me... Well, Formula One has been a massive success. What they've done with the Braves has been a massive success. I think that there's maybe fair criticism to ask how they own, like, maturing assets. Maybe there's some criticism there. Uh, but I don't know if that's just the cycle of how stocks trade when they mature. Right. And, and I, uh, what I was going with my point was the only time I've lost money in this business is when people lie. Right. I mean, yeah. now, now we're going down a path of kind of nefarious actors. And maybe it's as simple as someone gives you a wink when they shouldn't or a head nod. But I was in telecom in the MCI era right? Like I've seen it where there's blatant malfeasance, like misstatements. And I guess going back to the Amherst point, at no point in my five-year journey with this company, have I seen anything that kind of doesn't pass the smell test. I, I've seen things I don't like, right? I've seen allocations of capital I don't agree with, but reasonable people can disagree. And I'm not in the, the room. All I'm doing is allocating capital to or from a security and I happen to think these are really moral people trying to do their best. Yeah.
Well, that's all that you can really ask from people, right? And that's it. And at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I ran our intern program at Pinnacle and we, we you know, th- this is the really hard thing about this business is you can learn EBITDA, right? You can learn enough to be dangerous pretty quickly. This is not neurosurgery where you need to go through 10 years of schooling to be in the room to get that chance. Like you spend six months with some financials and you read the md and you get into it, you're going to know enough to be dangerous. The hard part is kind of the life, the, the time in cockpit, if you will. And it takes, and people kind of look at me like I'm crazy when I say the apprenticeship takes four, five, six years to get to that point where your judgment is not clouded with innocence. It's not clouded with jaded. You know, it's like you've been in it, you've been in enough cycles, you've been in enough moments, enough interactions that you can kind of see if there's a smell test that works or not. And people always also laugh at me um, when I talk about the I, I really view our our business as um, artistic in some way, right? Anyone can do a tracking model, right? Like you're working on dish. Anyone can track where it's been historically. The art in our business comes when you want to look out two, three, four years, right? Like that JP Morgan analyst with Amaris was kind of poo-pooing the fact that they were saying only a billion dollars in revenue in 2025 versus $2 billion. But she's totally forgetting that a year and a half ago, revenues were $150 million. <laughs> like, yeah, it is, I, it is really impressive growth. If I take a step back and I, and I strip out kind of management over-promising, under-delivering, which Amaris has done, and I kind of just more look at what they've actually accomplished, like they're about to announce a molecule sale in the next month or two. I don't know when, but soon. Um, it's, it's, under, it's under HSR review right now. That's going to bring in 300 to $350 million in cash up front. It's going to bring in 500 million in total deal deal value. That is literally cumulatively more than every other molecule sale they've done historically, cumulatively. And yet, because John Mello, the CEO, was so enthusiastic about it in July when the deal was kind of in the final stages, mm. he says, "Hey, get, hey, guess what, guys? Instead of 250 million dollars up front, it's going to be 350 million." And because he raised his own bar, because he was excited and he saw mm. the potential. People felt let down or something. Well, then all of a sudden, let's say you deliver 280, which by yeah. the way is still above the original 250. Let's not forget yeah. that. But because we didn't meet the new expectation, oh, we can't believe anything he says. And this is, to me, the craziness of it when I talk about kind of emotional capitulation, that we're at a stage with this company in particular that people literally will not believe a word out of the person's mouth until there's an SEC filing. And I get that. That's, that's cover your ass stuff. I get it. And that's what value investing is at at the core, right? Value investing is this idea that we look at what we can look at, we make an assessment and we go, but very rarely do true value investors in that sense speculate. Do they say, okay, well, maybe behind door number two, there's this. And and just, I mean, we're talking way too much amorous, but I'll give you one example. There's one other source of squalene Everyone uses and no one talks about. So forgetting like the beauty component. Okay, that's really cool, but forget that. Do you know what's, what's the bulk of your annual flu shot? Like what's in that little vial that you get? I mean, I'm assuming that you're setting me up to say squalene. Right, but okay, so there's a little bit of RNA. And if you're older, you get a different dose of RNA because older people need different doses. Than we do. But there's something called an adjuvant. An adjuvant is basically a booster. And an adjuvant can be a heavy metal, like aluminum, which by the way, going back to like the 80 year old grandfather. Maybe, Doesn't sound great in my body. This is what I'm saying to like swallowing. If you actually look at what we put in our bodies, it's, it's a little concerning. Um, but the point, what's the other adjuvant that's used? Shark-based squalane. What all of a sudden the COVID pandemic comes, we're doing a lot more vaccines with that. We're running out of shark-based squalane for flu shots. And hmm. so, you know, I'm not, in my model, zero dollars assigned to this potential. I want to be very clear, zero dollars in my model. But does that not mean I'm aware of it? And that could be an exponentially changing thing. And this is the point. You find these companies that are really hard to, to look at, hard to categorize. You know, Amaris is categorized under Gix as a materials company, but you can make an argument it's healthcare. You can make biotech, right? You can make an argument it's an IT company. You can make all sorts of sector stuff. Going back to what we said, value versus growth. People want to put you in a, in a bucket. And I think I've spent my whole career trying to look at opportunities beyond the bucket because the bucket, at least the bucket placing, I find very tedious. Yeah, that makes sense. 
so the long term in theory is a bunch of short terms, right? I mean, I, it, by definition, I guess it is. But, you know, when you see a company um, drop their guide by 50%, I'm not, I'm not trying to just be amorous specific, but I do think it's a very interesting conversation to have with you because uh, I think it's very illustrative of how you think about things. So I, I apologize if it's been super specific on one name, well, but let, I let me, find it fascinating. Let me let me change it to one other name, okay? And, and I, yeah, yeah. I, I know that we don't always talk stocks on this podcast, but it's interesting. Another name that I'm known for. You're like, going to have to come back on because you only have 20 more minutes, but you, <laughs> we're just going to do a part two to this. Yeah, we'll do part two. But the the other part of the unholy trinity that I'm known for is a stock called Renalytics, okay? RNLX is the ADR. And this is a company that is trying to cure uh, kidney disease. I mean, if you look at problems in our country and the world, you know, by 2030, 30% of Americans will be morbidly obese, meaning 100 pounds overweight. Oof. Okay? It's not good. It's not bueno. It's like, no. The team of things is like, <laughs> ah, maybe we should. And by the way, the, the two public companies in the space, are Davida and Fresenius, maybe 20 billion in market cap between them. And they're dialysis companies, right? And yeah. so for your I've got a tire company investment. Maybe that's a derivative, more more downforce on cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, can I actually pause on that? Uh, yes. When we did this work, you know, in the Gabelli offshoot with Salmoyo, we used to do our tracking models by hand. And the reason we did them by hand was because when companies restate numbers, as most companies do, in an Excel model, you wouldn't see it when you printed it out. So if you did it by hand and you hashed out each yeah. column, you could be like this. And you know the company that had the best report card? I, I don't know if it still is, but Mary at one point had it framed on his wall. You may not know this story. Genuine Parts, GPC, which owns Napa, huh. never had a restatement, at least, at least in that era. I haven't looked at it lately. Interesting. And that was like the gold standard of like, put it out there and here's what it is. Well, anyway, th the point on Renalytics is that we mentioned dialysis. By the way, if you're on dialysis, which is your, your, your kidneys aren't functioning, you get plugged into a machine, you get your kidneys flushed out over a couple hours. It's basically a week's worth of kidney function. Maybe you do it twice a week. Um, you're not in the dawn of your years, right? And so people, their jaws drop when they hear this. 22% of Medicare's budget is spent on chronic kidney disease and dialysis. And people are like, how is that possible that a fifth of my tax dollars to CMS, Medicare, are going? And the answer is pretty simple. Bill, if you, heaven forbid, ever need dialysis, you can't drive yourself, right? So you need to be driven from your house to the center and back. And so it just yeah. starts adding costs. And so the Grand Canyon of kidney care is, we mentioned the Vita and Fresenius that are doing the end of life stuff. And then there's this huge Grand Canyon. And on the other side of it is a company called Renalytics. That's this tiny little company that's basically giving the diagnostic. It's a liquid biopsy. You get a blood draw and they say, are you going to have stage four kidney disease or not? Because the only way you hmm. know today is you get really bad back pain. You go to the ER, the doctor comes in and says, oops, you got stage three kidney disease. It's too late. And when you talk about like your annual physical, everyone knows their cholesterol. But if I asked you like, what's your creatinine levels right now? I bet you don't know. Most no. primary care physicians don't test it. And in fact, I hmm. had my blood draw for mine at the end of December and the nurse taking my blood for all my normal stuff. I was like, well, is there a urine test? She's like, and she goes through the, she's like, oh no, the doctor didn't ask for it. I'm like, yeah, but it's a physical. Shouldn't we be testing? And she's like, oh, I can't put it in because it's not in the system. And like our medical system is broken. I don't know if that's a big yeah. surprise to people in your you know, audience, but it's broken. The reason I say this is that these guys have a CPT code. They have a, a reimbursement amount of $950 a test. But because, and Mount Sinai in New York owns 16% of the company. Fine, that's all backstory. But you ask the question of like, how do you stay with these stories? And to a lot of people, this is, this is a science experiment, right? They're in early days, a million dollars of top line revenue. They're not, they're not pushing a lot of tests out yet. They're still waiting for final FDA approval. So they're not pushing tests to the system yet. And the amount of people that have said to me, Randy, this is just a science experiment versus saying, okay, Let's assume you get 2% of a population five years from now, and you discount that back. What should that be, right? Yeah. And that's where I kind of find myself with the crossroads. I have the quantitative skill set to do the DCF, to kind of go through it. But the part that interests me more is the art 
in combination with saying, are we helping something, right? Like I could do the same thing with a private prison. I don't want to own private prisons because I want to sit at the dinner table and talk with my kids about what I own. And I don't really feel, I don't have a, a, a more poetic way to say icky. Like, I don't want to feel icky about what I own. I want to be able to talk about, okay, this, this is something that's going to help the world. And, you know, not all of those shots on goals are going to work. Or I should say, they're not all going to be what you hope they could be. But if two or three of them compound over time, that's a career. Yeah. So how do you think about, uh, like, sizing something like that? Because it, it does sound, it, it strikes me as fairly binary. I, I mean, I know that's not actually true, but it's, it seems like zero is in the equation uh, from an equity standpoint. So I, I, think, I think what you said earlier, which would apply, is you allocate a little bit, and then as they continue to execute, you can build into that. Well, Renalytics, Renalytics is a great example because this was a unicorn. This was a billion dollar valuation at its peak. Last year, it was down, you know, call it November of 21 through December of 22 was down 95%. Oof. Okay. And by the way, pause there. If you were looking for sectors to go truffle hunting in today, I would argue healthcare is probably one of them in the sense that the IBB, which is the S&P subcomponent that does just healthcare, was essentially given up half a decade worth of gains. In that last five years, you've had SGRT2 inhibitors, which is for the kidney of CAR-T, which is heart. Like you've had a lot of innovation being assigned negative value from the markets. And I guess my answer to your question is, I like to be on the other side of the field, right? If everyone's rushing to the end zone, I wanna be 20 yards away, just waiting. And so how we did Renalytics is, we were their first U.S. investor to what we talked about at the outset. This was a U.S.-based company. They're based out of Utah. They have operations in uh, New York. We mentioned Mount Sinai. That's where their CLIA lab is, mentioned in South Florida as well. Uh, but they chose to list in the U.K. in the heart of COVID that summer. They cross-listed the NASDAQ J.P. Morgan-led deal. Uh, I was their first U.S. investor, institutional investor. And as the stock went up, we put more in, right? Hmm. Once the stock started rolling off, we sold some for tax reasons and we kind of went to the sideline. When it hit the high single digits, we went in again. And then the real answer to your sizing question is that at the end of last year, we went back in when the stock was under $2 a share on an ADR basis and made it really count top three, which it had not been at that point. And that's my point. When you, when you, oh, yes, there's always a chance something can be a zero, but if you assign a probability to it, of less than call it four five percent that's an asymmetric setup for returns and you know amorous is the same thing you know someone i'm not a poker player but someone walked me through like the poker math that if you assign the chance that there's you know 80 percent chance this strategic transaction we talked about gets done right and you assign the chance that maybe there's a 75 percent chance john door will show up if needed to fund the company, it's 0.2 times 0.25, and you basically get to you know under 5% chance of a true zero, and it's even less when you go. And that's kind of how I think about it, which is you know these things so well that you have your arms around all of it. And the, the real interesting thing on Amaris is I'm not a PhD biologist or chemist. And one of the things that I think is fascinating about Amaris is all of the critiques are about the management team. I have yet to hear a critique of the science. Hmm. Right, so I don't need to therefore spend time worrying about well, maybe the science is wrong, which would go, which would go core to saying the business model is flawed, right? Because the science and they keep selling molecules like there's a there's a essentially a foundry business there that's a library they can sell, and the same thing goes with the Renalytics where you talk with their president who's dealt with they basically took the precision cancer model and they applied it to kidney kidney as we talked about the primary care physicians is a forgotten thing that you, you hope you never have but if you're dealing with it you probably was caught too late. And they realized there was this huge opportunity. The VA, in fact, two weeks ago, the Veterans Association came out and said, we have a lot of issues with diabetes. We need to be better about this. This is nationally covered by the VA 10-year contract. Hmm. It's interesting. It's, 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 uh, I like, you know, it's, it's fun to talk to somebody that's uh, classically trained in what I, what I would perceive to be value. And here you are spending your, your time in very forward-thinking uh, ideas on average. Well, and I'll give you, I'll give you the full circle. So I started as a telecom media and a TMT. That's where I made my bones. And today telecom media in terms of my fund is less than 
which is kind of like glaring. Uh, but we mentioned Chad Garcia. Chad and I were at a telecom conference two or three weeks ago, and we were sitting. I gotta get invited to these things. I'm media. Come on. I mean, this get, was. But no, this was. Hot, this, shout out to the banks. Jaw, get me involved. This was jaw dropping. What happened here? Um, I don't. Even, I don't even know if he'll remember. We're sitting with the CFO of uh, Lumen, which is the old level three global crossing. Yeah. And he's not from the telecom world, but the very first thing he's talking about, the CFO, was that, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, so understand that I'm, I'm just remembering the best I can. He's like, yeah, we're all in a dying business. And I was like, and mind you, I've owned landline telephone in the past. I've, I've heard the melting ice cube metaphor, right? But basically he's like, yeah, all of us are just trying to figure out who's going to be the last man standing as our business has declined. And by the mm -hmm. way, what he meant by that was the global crossing network from two plus decades ago is not as robust fiber as would exist today, right? So you can overlay that. I, I get what he's saying, but I kind of heard that. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's not the interesting part of the wheel, at least to me at this stage of my journey, right? And so the two telecoms that I own, one is a Chinese data center, the best private data center in China. I love data centers, but I love them more when they're 50% you know, top line and 40% EBITDA margins, like it's amazing. And a tower company, that's uh, in Nigeria and South America, right? Mm. IHS is that ticker. And so, you know, why do I like it? Well, at the end of the day, tower companies still trade for call it 25 or 30 times AFFO or cash flow effectively. This company's trading at under eight times AFFO. Mm. And while I totally acknowledge country risk premia should exist 100%, yeah. I'm just saying- it Maybe that's be, a bit much. It's a bit much. And, you know, that was a IHS as a company. Great example. Uh, the RBC analyst, John Atkins, a friend, and he called me up and said, Randy, you got to meet these guys. This is so up your alley. Because they know. I was an early investor in GDS, which is the Chinese data center company. And it's the same kind of story where when I invested in GDS initially, no one, this is, I think it IPO'd six years ago. $12 IPO had fallen to $7. I'm sitting at a lunch with the CEO and CFO uh, at a New York restaurant. And they're lamenting their share price. They're lamenting that no one seems to care. And I was like, guys, it's a great opportunity. Buy more shares. And they did. Like they've owned more personally. And then all of a sudden that stock ran eventually at $114. It, it's, it has since come back in with all the China shenanigans, but that's not company specific. That's just back, you know, backdrop. IHS is the same thing. IPO'd at $18 a share just a little over a year ago. You know, today you're paying $7.50. Hmm. Like the business is getting better. It's not like operationally. And this is kind of the takeaway from our conversation. Like I'm totally wedded to the point that the market is manic and it's maybe more manic now than it's ever been, right? It's always euphoric and that's probably what it was in 21 or it's crazy depressed. And there's a lot of opportunity if you take the time to look on that side of the scale and over time, that tends to work out pretty well. Hmm. Holler at me if you ever look at Dish. It's fascinating. I'm not interested in owning it, but I do think it's fascinating. I, I actually signed up for Boost Mobile and. Uh, they have a MVNO with T-Mobile as a result of the T-Mobile Sprint deal. And then they also have an MVNO with uh, AT&T. And I don't know if it's because I'm the only guy on this particular cell tower because it's still beta, yeah. but it is the best cell service I've ever had by far. Uh, it, it's really, I liked Comcast because it saved me money. I like this because I like it. It's it's actually really interesting. Yeah, and but they have a long way to go. That that there's a well, lot of stuff the way, they have to do. Just your audience knows they need to raise a ton of money still, like four to five that's billion dollars. Right. And they did a yes. debt, they did a debt issuance this week. That's the beginning of it. I mean, there's still more to come. Yeah, I didn't see where it was priced. I didn't see where it was priced. It's a five hundred million dollar yeah. deal. But the point is uh, that the their chief tech guy was at that same telecom conference, and he's absolutely adamant that they're going to hit all the FCC requirements for build out. Um, cause that's the big overhang in the stock. If, if you don't build it out, the FCC takes your spectrum back, but they only have to get like 50% of the way there to get an extension, which I think is why they're so, I am pretty sure that's what the, uh, agreement says that may not be yeah, factual, and, and, but and I think that's it. why they're totally adamant. Like we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And then they're going to go back and say, we were really trying our hardest. We only got this far. Can we have this extension? One of the yes. things on dish that I don't quite get is if you look at their spectrum, I think there's like eight or nine different classes of spectrum. And, you know, I don't know what your phone has in it, but most phones today don't have 10 different radios in it because it would destroy your battery life. Yeah. So like there are some propagation issues because they have like 600 meg all the way up to like 4.3 gig. Like it's a very, very diverse band of spectrum. Um, just because I say 
I don't want to compete with the Goldman analyst head to head doesn't mean I can't play in the same sandbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's one of those things I would imagine it like uh, it rekindles your old career, yeah. right? So you may you may be interested. Exactly. I just think it's I think it's fascinating. I also think, uh, you know, part of what they they've said publicly and people say they got to merge with DirecTV. I can't think DirecTV is going to have a solid business losing Sunday ticket. Uh, I mean, all else equal. Well, and that at t deal, I mean, it just, this goes to the, to the Lumen guy's point about these dying businesses. Like they try to like yeah. grab spaghetti against the wall. I mean, that was just an awful business. And by the way, you mentioned Liberty, like at the conference, we we're talking about Lilac has not been a good business. Cable wireless yeah. had the first monopoly in telecom ever. And the Liberty Latin America Lilac business probably going to need to be rolled up at some point. There's some tax. The thing with Malone, people don't always appreciate is sometimes he does things for tax reasons that trump everything else and yeah. so tactically you got to be aware of that yeah 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 that that goes to the old make sure you're playing the same game that the uh controlling shareholders playing exactly sometimes you're not and that cannot be great well that's awesome man what else, do you have anything else you want to cover in the next four minutes no i um like i said i really appreciate the privilege you and i circled a long time to try and get here i i hope there was some some kernels in that conversation as always you know i as you picked up with me talking I, I listened to your podcast a lot and i think the range of people you have is um is heroic so i'm glad i can end well thank you here. it's been fun it's one of the joys uh you know being able to talk to people that think differently i i don't know man i i thought i knew all the answers now i'm not even sure i know the questions to ask right. but and, and i, I phrase, enjoy it and that phrase reasonable people can disagree right? Everyone yeah. can disagree with my stock. Pick. Sure. But let's at least have an intellectual conversation. Let's not get caught up in the emotional vitriol, which is kind of where I feel we are in a lot of things. Yeah, I agree with you. And part of why I, I like this pursuit is uh, I see people talk past each other all the time, like especially on social media, right? And it's like, okay, well, I think if we had a conversation, we'd probably agree on more than we disagree. But you know, that's, that's fine. Then you find out where you disagree and God forbid you might learn something, you know? So, yeah. And it feels very much like someone's talking and another person's waiting. And it's like, blah, 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 my line, my line, blah, 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 my <laughs> line, my line. And it's like, who can, who can have the, uh, you know, the, the, the quick wit and all that stuff. Um, it's the reason to, to what we're talking about before about not looking at stock prices every minute of the day. It's the reason I'm not on Twitter. It's the reason I'm not yeah. on social because, you know, I benefit from listening to podcasts like this. I don't benefit from the trolls telling me, you know, I'm a bad person because I own something. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. No. Well, I appreciate you coming on. You have a, an evergreen invite and uh, hopefully we'll do part two and it won't just be about uh, Amaris, but I, I really do appreciate you going into how you think about owning it because I, it's, I think it's an important conversation. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from the past five years. And when when owning a company for that long, I think you're bound to get punched in the face eventually. Right. So it's like, how do you take it? How do you figure out if you're wrong? Like, those are the conversations I'm much more interested in having. But the beauty of that is you get away from the arc of time. In other words, while quarters matter, like I really and I say this to the Renalytics CEO, I'm like, you're 95 percent. Here's a blessing of that. You should never give guidance. Once you're delivering those tests, you don't need to give guidance. You've already been in the penalty box. So why make hurdles that you may have stress over meeting at some point? And you know, I think to what we said at the outset, this idea of private equity in public form helps weather a lot of those storms. Because I'm looking in terms of decades, not in terms of days. Yeah. Well, I like the thought. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and uh, I got to let you go. So thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.